You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War. It's the night after WWF Over the Edge in your house and we've got two jam-packed shows to look at this week, the jams spilling all over the place. Raw's live from Chicago, Illinois tonight, while WCW Nitro's live from Washington, DC. Before we get started, we've got a jam-up couple who checked out the merch over on WrestlingBios.com. Two German broadversts named Mikael and Freddy. These two took care of horseman business in Austria, hitting the slopes harder than Kidman on a smack binge. Freddy couldn't have cared less about wrestling until she started watching Reliving the War with Mikael, so that's pretty awesome. Welcome aboard the Jam Express, guys. Alright, let's do it. Another week, another episode of Reliving the War. Nitro begins with a pretty sweet video package looking at Sting. It's pretty short, but you get the message. Sting has evolved over the years and now he's arrived at another crossroad. Is he NWO black and white? Is he NWO Wolfpack? Or is he gonna remain part of Team WCW? The commentary team say that all signs point to Sting making a decision tonight and we're likely going to hear some pitches from the different groups who want Sting to join up. James J. Bebe Dylan arrives in a limousine along with DDP, Booker T and Goldberg. These guys represent WCW of course and they must have been discussing how they can get Sting to do the right thing and stay with the company that brought him to the dance. The next group arrive after Jerry Lynn with an F and Ernest Miller have a kung fu match to open up Nitro. Ernie Miller won the match with a front spin kick that made absolutely no contact. The Wolfpack arrive in their limousine and out in the arena the Wolfpack music plays for the very first time on Monday Nitro. You'll also notice Kurt Hennig's now on crutches. Nash gets in the ring and he alters Scott Hall's survey a bit by asking the audience if they came to see NW Hollywood or the Red and Black Attack. The fans are very much behind the Wolfpack tonight and Lex Luger says he hopes Sting notices all the Red and Black shirts in the audience tonight when he makes his decision. Sting and Lex are good friends, but Lex hasn't heard from his buddy since last week. Luger says he and Sting have always been winners and the Wolfpack are a group of winners, so Sting needs to make the right choice tonight on Monday Nitro. Luger then throws out a challenge, Nash in the total package versus Hollywood Hogan and the Giant, and Lex hopes that this match will act as some sort of reinforcement for Sting's decision. On Thunder, Raven and Saturn became best buddies again. Raven then attacked a vendor who he thought was Canyon, but Canyon was actually standing by as an inconspicuous handyman. A little callback to his former Men at Work tag team gimmick perhaps. So while keeping an eye out for Canyon, Raven and Saturn took on the public enemy on Nitro, and almost instantly Saturn was having problems with Raven. Raven tagged out after doing the bare minimum. He wasn't in any rush to get back in the ring and help Harry out when the public enemy got the upper hand and Raven even accidentally hit Saturn with a clothesline. Still, through all this, Saturn got the victory for his team after planting Johnny Grunge with a death volley driver. And to thank Saturn for all his efforts, Raven puts him in a match against Canyon at the Great American Bash. Plus, Raven rehired the flock to give Perry a little extra security for the pay-per-view encounter. Keep in mind that JJ Dillon booked Raven vs Canyon for the Great American Bash, so basically Saturn was going to do Raven's dirty work and Perry wasn't happy about this at all. Skeet skeet skeet, slap your bratwurst across my cheek. Two. Oh, big bratwurst. Alex Wright took on Chavo Guerrero next and Alex taught Chavo a thing or two about being the best wrestler in the world today. Chavo couldn't get started, Daz Wunderkind had an answer for absolutely everything and Chavito was running out of options. So Chavo decided to snap like Kenny Boy Shamrock and our hero found himself in a world of trouble. Chavo kept the pressure on outside the ring and it looked like Alex was gonna cry in his hotel room tonight while dancing in front of his mirror. But then this happens, Alex applies an STF and Chavo tops out in seconds. 
It's a really weird finish, but I'll take it. Das Wunderkind is still the man in WCW. Chavo tries to attack Alex after the bout, but Eddie runs down to break things up. Eddie has some great news for Chavo, and he needs to tell him right away. The Great American Bash match between the Guerreros doesn't need to happen because Eddie's letting Chavo go. Chavo's free from Uncle Eddie from this point on. The thing is, Chavo's lost his mind, and he still wants to fight his uncle. Chavo even thinks he can beat Eddie at the pay-per-view, so. Eddie's attempt to get out of this upcoming match at the Great American Bash has completely failed it seems. Roddy Piper was scheduled for an interview next, but Randy Savage came out instead. Macho says Hogan and Brett are going to get crushed in the tag team match from hell at the pay-per-view, but Savage has something to say to his partner tonight, so Roddy Piper gets called out. Savage tells Piper to his face that he's going to use him at Bash at the Beach to beat Brett and Hogan, and then Savage is going to get himself some satisfaction by going after Piper. Macho's going to fight Roddy immediately after the match, and Piper again tells Macho that it's Bret Hart who's causing all these issues. The hitman's conning Randy Savage, and Randy just can't see it. Roddy reminds Savage that Bret Hart isn't wearing an NWO shirt, and that's because Bret Hart isn't on the team. He's conning everyone right now, but Randy doesn't care about Bret's shirt or his underwear for that matter. Macho Man will be at the Great American Bash, and he reiterates that he's going after Piper once he gets through with Hollywood and the hitman. Raw kicks off with a Mick Foley promo. On Nitro, JJ Dillon addresses Sting. So, we've been here before. Foley sits in the ring without a gimmick and he's looking pretty beaten up. He says Stone Cold kicked his ass last night, but Foley learned a lesson in regards to listening to the wrong people. So, Mick wants to apologize, not to the fans, but to the chairman, the guy who gave him the opportunity at Over the Edge, Mr. McMahon. Vince comes out and Mick says he's sorry for not getting the job done. His face is a little wrecked at the moment though, so the dude needs to take a few weeks off, but when Foley comes back, he hopes to be number one contender again after the match he and Austin had last night at Over the Edge. McMahon won't have it, he calls Mick a miserable failure as a WWF superstar and as a human being, and if Mick wants Vince to accept his apology, then Foley needs to get down on his knees. Foley can't believe it, his kids are watching at home and he won't allow Vince to embarrass him on national TV, but Vince says Foley's already an embarrassment, he's an embarrassment to Vince, he's an embarrassment to himself, he's an embarrassment to the fans, and yes, he's an embarrassment to his family. So Foley better hurry up and get on his knees. Foley confesses that hitting McMahon with a chair last night felt pretty good. Vince tells him, well, if that's the case, then do it again. He invites Foley to smack him again across the head, but then he reminds Foley about his kid's college fund, his 20-year mortgage, the savings he set aside for his parents, and all this is enough to make Foley put the chair down and he reconsiders. McMahon says Stone Cold Steve Austin makes him a lot of money while Mick Foley makes him sick. Great line, by the way. And Vince wraps it up by saying, Mick Foley's services are no longer required. Foley has been fired from the WWF. While McMahon dances and Foley sits in disbelief, we learn about a few matches that are going to take place tonight on Raw. We've got some King of the Ring qualifiers and another DX vs Nation six-man tag. This time though, it's an elimination match. On Nitro, JJ Dillon says it pains him to see Sting torn in so many directions by so many people. Dillon can't promise Sting big movie roles like Hollywood Hogan can, and he can't make Sting so cool that people will say the Stinger's just too sweet. But even though Sting had some troubles with WCW throughout 1996 and 1997, the company still got him the match he wanted at Starcade last year, and WCW stood with Sting during his finest hour. If Sting stays with WCW, he'll always be the franchise of the company, and the company will always stand beside him. The World Heavyweight Championship needs to come back, and James J. Bay Bay Dillon wants Sting to be the man holding the belt. Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart cut a promo next on Nitro. On Raw, we've got Val Venus versus uh, Poppy Chulo. Uh, okay. NW Hollywood also arrive in a limousine, so Sting can definitely expect some luxurious travel arrangements no matter which team he ends up fighting for. Granted, if he joins NW Hollywood, he has to share limo space with the big bad booty man, so that would be an immediate no from me. 
Hogan says he and the Brotherhood saw that grey-haired, flamingo-legged Kevin Nash out here earlier on with his new stooge Lex Luger, and Hogan heard the main event challenge. Hogan accepts because he wants to show Sting that the power lies within the black and white NWO. In regards to the Great American Bash tag team match from hell, Hogan's annoyed that Piper and Savage are questioning Bret Hart's integrity and his loyalty towards NWO, and Bret wonders what he has to do to make it clear that he's one of the boys as he unbuttons his shirt to reveal a Hollywood Hogan t-shirt underneath. It's still not an NWO shirt, mind you, but Bret feels this is enough to show that he's loyal to the black and white. Bret says Hogan means the world to him, Hogan's the greatest of all time, and his t-shirt says it all. Hulk says this. Old Chinese proverb says, a t-shirt is worth a thousand words. Wait, what? Old Chinese proverb, a t-shirt says a thousand words. I'm not up to scratch on my old Chinese proverbs, but I'm pretty sure no Chinese philosopher ever said that. I prefer old Chinese proverb, man who has hand in his pocket feels cocky all day, or man who fishes in another man's hole will often catch crabs. But yeah, Hulk Hogan, master of old Chinese proverbs. I love it. Hogan says Piper and Macho will be in hospital beds after the match, and if they want to fight, they'll have to thumb wrestle instead. My money's on Macho Man right there. Hollywood rules, NWO for life, you know the drill. Check out Bret Hart though, he doesn't care a single bit. Over on Raw, a backstage street fight was booked between the LOD and the DOA. Yeah, I know. Drozdov got some promo time before the bout and he used this precious TV time to throw up on Kevin Kelly. LOD 2000 joined the promo and Droz continued the bar fall over Double K, but then the backer Michael Acker showed up and the two teams went to war. Not a lot to say here really, it's exactly what you'd expect. It ended without a clear winner because The Undertaker appeared and the Phenom took out the last man standing, Chains and Darren Drozdov. Taker walked into the building and he demanded to know where Vince McMahon was at. Back in the arena, we got Val Venus vs Poppy Chulo. Val says to the ladies before the match, no, he's not happy to see them, that's a gun in his pocket and it doesn't shoot blanks. This lady right here soaked up the whole arena. Val got pretty aggressive at the opening bell and Poppy got taken out with a double underhook suplex. Val then applied a camel clutch and that poor camel took a grinding from the big Val Boski and Venus stayed in control with a suplex and a falling power slam. Poppy Chudo came back with a spinning wheel kick and he managed to stun Venus with a drop kick, but that's about all he was able to do in this matchup. A crucifix attempt gets countered with a Val Venus Samoan drop and Venus picks up the win after splashing his opponent with a big old money shot. The fans absolutely love Val Venus, there's no denying it. Next up, we've got The Undertaker cutting a promo on Raw while Conan takes on Lenny Lane on Monday Nitro. Lenny's back out here with his ab spray named Absolution, and hey, give him credit, he's got his own little gimmick going on and at least he's trying something different rather than coming out and being another by the numbers pro wrestling heel. K-Dog, however, doesn't care much for cheap little gimmicks. After winning the initial lockup sequence, Conan's able to put Lenny down with a sit down face buster. Lenny then gets locked in a pendulum swing submission and he's able to get up and get in his bulldog. Seems like Lenny always gets at least the bulldog in during every matchup. He thinks a dropped toe holds the best way to keep momentum on his side, but well, it wasn't. Conan hits Leonard with an Alabama slam, Conan hits the 187 cradle DDT, and Lenny gives it up after getting locked in a tequila sunrise. After the bout, Rick Rude and Kurt Hennig come out and Rude says Hennig challenged Goldberg to a match at the Great American Bash. Only problem is, Kurt's going to be on crutches over the next 10 days and JJ Dillon's book Goldberg vs Hennig matches for live shows in the run up to the pay per view. Conan joins Rude and Kurt and Conan has no problem at all filling in for Hennig in the run up to the bash, and Hennig says they'll be calling the US champ Bill Goldturd once Kurt gets through with him. <laughs> Goldturd. I think you get the picture, wee willy. Over on Raw, The Undertaker shows up uninvited and he has quite a lot to say tonight. He says Vince McMahon has always been known as a guy who gives people opportunities and he did just that when he allowed Mark Calloway to be The Undertaker. After arriving in the WWF, Taker became a dragon slayer. McMahon put every giant and every freak in front of The Undertaker and Taker destroyed each and every one of them. In doing so, Undertaker made the WWF safe for Vince McMahon and his hand-picked champions. Taker would only get title opportunities when those giants and freaks disappeared from WWF, but Taker's title reigns didn't last long because McMahon didn't want someone like The Undertaker representing his company. Still though, Taker was loyal. Even when those handpicked champions left for more money, the Phenom stayed loyal to WWF. 
And how does The Undertaker get repaid? He's forced to fight his brother and Paul Bear gets a platform to talk about personal issues that should never air on TV, all to get television ratings. While Taker's dealing with family business, he sees Steve Austin rising to the top and Undertaker's had enough. He wants what's rightfully his, the dead man demands a shot at the WWF Championship. Vince comes out to face the Reaper after getting called out by Undertaker and McMahon's angry that Taker chokeslammed him last week and he watched over him like a vulture at Over the Edge, so if Taker wanted Vince's attention then he's most definitely got it. Vince appreciates Undertaker's loyalty and he thanks him for it, but Vince asks, what have you done for Vince McMahon lately? Vince wonders if Paul Bear's telling the truth about Pork and Mommy Taker, something that really annoys the dead man obviously, and Vince then eases the tension a little by an announcing that Undertaker does indeed deserve to be number one contender. McMahon says, no problem, job done, but only if Taker defeats his opponent tonight on Raw. The winner of the match will become number one contender for Steve Austin's WWF Championship, so let's see what happens when The Undertaker faces his little brother Kane tonight on Raw. Steve Mavuggan Blackman vs Mark Merrow on Raw, Eddie Guerrero vs Fit Finley on Nitro. The Raw match is a King of the Ring qualifier and here's the 1998 tournament brackets. It's not bad, not bad at all. Kama's name has been officially changed to The Godfather as we can see right here. Stevie Blackman could face Double J if he wins his match tonight against Merrow. Rock's involved in the tournament and we've got Triple H vs X-Pac which sounds interesting too. Also, Owen could wrestle Dan Severn again if both men win their first round matches. The winner of this King of the Ring tournament is painfully obvious though. Steve Blackman's gonna become King Mavug and he's gonna rule over WWF with an iron fist. First though, he has to take out marvelous Mark Merrow. Merrow has a surprise. Sable may be in home in the kitchen where she belongs. Mark's words, not mine by the way. But Mark wants to introduce a woman who's everything Sable's not. She's black, she's beautiful, she beat the hell out of Disco Inferno in WCW and then proceeded to do absolutely nothing after afterwards, it's Jacqueline. Now this presents a problem for Steve Blackman because it was at this very moment that Steve Blackman fell in love. Yes, Steve-O's laser eyes popped out of his head when he saw Jackie, and now he can't focus. He thinks that beating Mero up will make Jackie fall into his big hunky arms and Mero knows it, so Marvelous Mark gives Jackie a hug on the outside to further chip away at Steve's current state of mind. Blackman thinks if he wrecks Mero's face then Jackie won't want any part of the Marvelous one, so Mark's mug becomes the prime focus of Steve's offense. But this is just a bad battle plan, we all know that Steve's at his best when he's attacking the midsection. A moment of clarity arrives and Steve delivers the motherfucker kick but his heart gets shattered into a million pieces when Jackie helps Merrow out by putting his foot on the bottom rope. Steve then shows his hand and he says to Jackie, look we just met but I need you in my life. And of course Mero takes advantage, there will be no Blackman baby making tonight there big Stevie cool. We see a low blow, we see a Samoan drop and Marvelous Mark must be feeling frisky tonight because he pulls off the wild thing. We haven't saw that in a while but you gotta pull out the big guns for Steve Blackman. Mark Mero advances in the King of the Ring tournament and Blackman advances into life with a broken heart. On Nitro, the TV title was on the line when Fit Finley defended against Eddie Guerrero and it was a very back and forth match that unfortunately didn't go on too long. Eddie brought it to the mat early on and Finley was able to take the lead with hard strikes and by also using Eddie's momentum to his advantage. As the match progressed though and as Eddie chipped away at Finley, it looked like the challenger had a chance at winning the championship. Eddie pulled off his apron front senton and he started getting a little vicious by laying the boots in, but Chavo Guerrero came down and the match got thrown out. Chavo wanted Uncle Eddie to hit him, he kept saying hit me Eddie over and over again and Eddie got a little freaked out. So Guerrero ran away from Finley, his little nephew and all of life's problems. Fit Finley remains TV champion. It should have been more, it had the potential to be match of the week but that didn't happen unfortunately. The Bad Mama Jamma Chris Jericho takes on Juventud Guerrero next. On Raw we have got that DX vs Nation match. So this week we get spared the road dog speech but Triple H won't miss a chance to cut a pre-match promo. I got two words for you. Shut up. 
Commissioner Slaughter comes out and he sends the guys not involved in the match back to the locker room, so the Godfather, Mark Henry, China, and X Pac leave the ringside area. Dilo was the first man eliminated. Every member of DX got in some offense, with Triple H hitting the Harley Race knee, Road Dog hitting a knee drop, and Billy Gunn sending Dilo out of the match with a pile driver. Rock then came in and he found himself in DX's corner for a brief moment, but he fights his way out and he immediately eliminates Road Dog with a rock bottom. There's definitely some rock fans in Chicago tonight too, by the way. Billy guns in and he takes the lead as soon as his tag team partner leaves the ring, but Owen gets a blind tag and the Soul Survivor comes in with a missile dropkick. Owen then gets the opportunity to hit Gunn with a spinning wheel kick and Billy Gunn gets eliminated. A spinning wheel kick doesn't normally win matches. In elimination matches though, all moves get power upgrades it seems. Triple H is all alone against Owen and The Rock, so for some unexplained reason China reappears to stand in Hunter's corner. Things are looking bleak for Triple H when we come back from a commercial break. He tries to fight back but he takes a diving elbow from Owen and Rock puts him down for a people's elbow. Triple H kicks out so Rock sets up a rock bottom and Hunter counters it with a pedigree. China keeps Owen distracted so Rock's shoulders get counted to the mat and now it's one on one. Unfortunately, after all this, it ends in disqualification when Ken Shamrock returns to Raw and he attacks Owen Hart. Owen gets wrecked here with a ton of punches followed by a belly to belly suplex so the nation run down to help out their comrade. Ken then gets help from an unlikely individual, one Dan the Man Severn. The Beast and Kenny Boy manage to clear out the ring and… oh, this is money right here. Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock look at each other with a lot of intensity as an old rivalry gets reignited on Raw, but there's no physicality. Dan takes his jacket and he leaves the ring. The ring announcer says the nation win the match via disqualification. Triple H isn't happy, so he shoves Kenny Boy. Ken doesn't like getting shoved all that much, so Shamrock attacks Triple H and officials are forced to jump in and break things up. They really should have kept Shamrock like this for longer, just an absolute unhinged madman who snaps at everyone. Good guys, bad guys, animals, women, children, insects, it shouldn't have mattered. On Nitro, we get to see another classic Chris Jericho segment next, a video showing us the former cruiserweight champion trying to prove he's a conspiracy victim. We see Chris standing outside the United States Capitol and he says he's gonna go in there and get evidence. Evidence that states JJ Dillon was wrong to not give Chris his cruiserweight championship back. Jericho gets kicked out and he's convinced that the folks inside the Capitol are in on the conspiracy. No one would listen to him. He then approaches some security guards with a simple question, who does Chris need to talk to to go over JJ Dillon's head? A guard says he doesn't know but Chris has to leave right away, and Chris believes these guys are in on the conspiracy too. Everyone's against Chris Jericho right now. He's then seen on the streets holding up a sign saying he's a conspiracy victim. He approaches a lady and he explains the whole situation at Slamboree dear, from the Battle Royal to Dean hiding underneath a mask. Chris tries to get a meeting with Bill Clinton because he knows he's a Jericho but he doesn't make it past the security guard at the front gate. And finally, Chris pays a visit to the Library of Congress. He's checking out a book but he can't find the section on WCW championship belts. Seriously, it was worth tuning into Nitro just to see Chris Jericho in 1998. This still holds up very well today. Chris makes his entrance in the arena and he says he's got it, he's got the information that will lead to JJ giving him his belt back, but Dylan won't come out to listen to what Jericho has to say. Jericho says Dylan must only have time for the big stars like Sting, but that's okay, because Chris will get his championship belt back very soon. Chris then had a match against Juventud Guerrera. Chris counters a snapmare attempt and we hear that satisfying noise when someone slams hard on a WCW ring. WCW ring sounds so blissfully distinctive. Hoovy fires back with a few chops and when he goes for a dive in Hurricane Rana he almost brains himself. Remember, hot and cold. A DDT from Hoovy also doesn't look too good and I can't help but think about that absolute show stealing match he had last week with Kidman. But still, Guerrera brushes it off and he manages to hit Chris with a Hoovy driver but Chris stops the 450. Jericho then has a chance to lock in the lion tamer, Hoovy makes it to the ropes, Chris ends up falling out of the ring and I was holding my breath when Guerrero went for another high risk move. Thankfully though, this one went alright. Reese's big cup crunchy interferes and he hits Hoovy with a double handed choke slam. Chris sees it and of course he decides to distract the referee. Once Reese gets out of the ring, Jericho covers Guerrero and Chris Jericho wins via pinfall. 
Backstage on Raw, The Undertaker's thinking about this match he has tonight with his little brother. Kane, meanwhile, spotted shaking hands with Vince McMahon. I'd wash that hand if I were you, Kane. God knows where it's been. We've got another King of the Ring qualifier, Double J vs Farouk. On Nitro, the Best of Seven series continues with Chris Benoit vs Booker T. So Double J makes his entrance and Tennessee Tommy Lee makes a huge announcement. The giant robot monster has agreed to join forces with Double J, my god. In order to compete in WWF, the monster split itself in two and it took the form of two human beings. And here it is, now known as Southern Justice, two guys with one mind, the mind of a robot monster. Steve Blackman would be out here right now to sort this mess out but he's mending a broken heart and a bad case of blue balls. So Farouk's gonna take over and erase the word of these hillbilly cyborgs along with Double J and Tennessee Brandon Lee. Double J starts the match while Farouk was getting ready but in no time at all Farouk hits Jarrett with a power slam. Sweet T Lee jumps on the apron but he gets right back down when Farouk's about to shove his hat up his bum hole. Southern Robot Justice looks on as Farouk lands a clothesline and Double J gets choked in the corner. Double J fires back by getting a boot up followed by a short arm clothesline and a body slam but he ends up missing an elbow drop and Farouk's back in control. The crowd chant we want flair as Jared takes a suplex. Rick's future in pro wrestling was uncertain and many fans believed that Rick would end up in WWF sooner rather than later but of course that didn't materialise. Farouk gets his wee dominator smashed on the top rope when he goes for an aerial attack but he comes back with a spine buster and then the robot monster jumps on the apron. Farouk fears no southern android tag team of course but the distraction lets Tennessee Peggy Lee throw a belt over to Double J and Farouk gets whacked with the buckle. Farouk gets pinned and Double J advances in the King of the Ring to meet Marvelous Mark Merrow. Right, so let me get you caught up on the Best of Seven series. On WCW Thunder, Benoit and Booker had one of the best matches of the series. Booker looked good in the early moments of the match but he was forced to play defense for most of the remainder. Chris even pulled off two damaging chin locks during the bout that really should have ended it but he went for the victory with a diving headbutt. Chris landed his finisher but he took too long to cover Booker. At the end of the bout Chris got caught with a Harlem sidekick and Booker was able to finish the job with his missile dropkick so the scores were one apiece. On WCW Saturday Night, Match 3 took place in the main event. This one was a little shorter but again it was mostly Benoit in control. Booker tried to catch Benoit again with a sidekick but he missed but Benoit also missed his diving headbutt. Still though, Benoit picked up the win when Booker countered the crossface but still found himself taking a German suplex. It was a good finish but I think you'd enjoy the Thunder match a little more. Going into Nitro then, Chris Benoit leads with 2 points to 1 and Booker starts the match off with a body slam that made our guy here get up and dance. Finley comes out again to watch the match as Booker hits a back elbow followed by a big power slam. It gets brought to the mat for a moment with an armbar from Booker T and then the former TV champ hits a top rope forearm that leads to Benoit rolling out of the ring. Chris gets back inside the ropes before his opponent and this gives him a chance to kick a hole in Booker's chest. He then delivers some seriously hard chops so naturally it's chin lock time, you gotta tame this guy somehow. Booker lands a clothesline, we then see the running forearm, there's chin lock number 2 right there and Benoit replies to all this with a German suplex, the same move he won match number 3 with. This time though Benoit hits hard too and he was unable to bridge after the move. Booker counters a backdrop attempt and we see the axe kick, he pulls off an awesome back suplex. Booker then sets Benoit up for a normal suplex but Benoit counters it with an arm trap. Look at how Booker takes the bump here, it's absolutely brilliant. Benoit applies the cross face, Booker gives it up so Benoit goes up 3-1 to one in this series. Booker really needs to get his act together if he wants to win this thing. Brilliant stuff as always though. Takamichi Noku vs Shofunaki on Raw, DDP vs Scotty Riggs on Monday Nitro. Taka's best mate Bradshaw comes to the ring alongside the light heavyweight champion and Taka starts it off right away with his crossbody to the outside. Funaki replies with a jumping hip attack and check this out, show Funaki with the perfect counter to a tornado DDT. Why hasn't anyone thought of this before? Taka counters a German suplex by landing on his feet and performing a hurricane rana. He then performs a moonsault, taking out both Funaki and Dick Togo on the outside. We then see Al Snow standing on the outside and… yeah, yeah, moving on. Taka hits a low dropkick but he misses a missile dropkick. Funaki fails to capitalize when he misses an elbow drop in spectacular fashion. So Taka ends up hitting that missile dropkick and he puts Funaki away with a Michinoku driver. Al Snow got escorted out of the arena during the end of the match and after a commercial break Al blames this all on Head. Head says she likes Egg Foo Young now and Al says Head looks ridiculous. 
We also get a brief Paul Bear promo before Raw moves on, and Paul's confident that Kane's gonna beat The Undertaker tonight on Raw. Kane's beat his brother when there was nothing at stake. With a shot at the gold up for grabs, Kane's gonna destroy his brother and go on to become WWF Champion. Thing is though, Kane hasn't beat Undertaker yet in a TV match, so I've no clue what Paul's talking about here. On Nitro, Scotty Riggs thought it would be a good idea to mock DDP, so Paige thought it would be a good idea to destroy Parrot Riggs ASAP. Riggs gets shoved to the mat, he gets punched in the face a few times, Dallas lays in a few boots and Riggs goes down after a tilt award and sidewalk slam. Sick Boy interferes, but he gets taken out immediately by Dallas. DDP then performs a gut buster on Riggs before signaling for the diamond cutter, and DDP DDP ends it just like that with a fireman's carry variation of his finishing move. Just for good measure, Sick Boy also takes a cutter, and Dallas leaves through the audience while the crowd goes crazy. Short, simple, but still very effective. Another King of the Ring qualifier on Raw, Terry Funk vs Mark Henry. On Nitro, Goldberg wrecks the parka. Vince McMahon has joined the commentary table and he's gonna stay there until the end of Raw. He says Terry Funk's now the king of hardcore now that Mick Foley's gone, and Terry gets to work with a neckbreaker followed by a sneaky low blow. Vince McMahon's looking forward to seeing a more aggressive Undertaker tonight and he says we're gonna find out how much Taker really wants to be champion in the main event. In the ring, Mark's turned it around and the match goes to the outside briefly where he catches Funk and he rams him into the ring post. But things get a bit spicy when Terry whacks Mark with a steel chair before pulling off an acai moonsault. Old Terry Funk really is one of a kind. In the ring, the two competitors clash into each other. Funk goes down, so Mark hits a splash, but Terry kicks out at two. Funk tries his best here. He tries to catch Henry out with a small package, but he's unable to defeat the world's strongest man to advance in the King of the Ring. Mark Henry delivers a power bomb, followed by another splash, and Mark wins via pinfall. Here's the updated brackets following tonight's King of the Ring matches. We'll check out some more qualifiers next week on Reliving the War. The Goldberg match on Nitro is a quick one, but it's also hilarious. Right at the opening bell, the parka cracks a chair over Goldberg's head. Goldberg shakes it off like the absolute animal he is. He's an animal! An animal! An animal! Goldberg then immediately spears the parka and the roof comes off the arena. The parka then takes the jackhammer, and again, Goldberg leaves the fans wanting more in the best way possible. I find it absolutely ridiculous how folks tend to downplay how big of a deal Goldberg really was, and it's always from fans who didn't witness things like this week by week. Sure, Goldberg never was an in-ring technician, but he wasn't supposed to be. All he had to do was kick ass, and the fans absolutely ate it up. 94-0 according to Bobby Heenan. Saturn took a loss to Goldberg once again at a house show on the 27th of May. On Thunder, Barry Horowitz felt the wrath of Billy Boy, so Goldberg, right now, is actually at 89-0. Raw ends this week with The Undertaker vs Kane. On Nitro, Hollywood Hogan and The Giant take on Kevin Nash and Lex Luger. Stone Cold Steve Austin joins Vince McMahon at the commentary desk for this one, so you'll probably want to go back and watch this just to hear Stone Cold calling the action. Undertaker dominates the first few moments of the match. Big right hands keep the big red machine stunned and Taker follows up with a corner splash. He then gets out of the ring to punch Paul Bear and back in the ring we see old school from the dead man. Kane stops Taker's onslaught with a chokeslam and it's the Phenom who gets punished in the corner this time. Taker gets thrown out of the ring where he takes a ring post bump. It gets back inside the ropes as Vince reminds us that Taker needs to show everyone how badly he wants the WWF title during this match. But Vince also doesn't care who wins really, he just wants Austin to lose his championship. Taker begins fighting back but Kane puts the Phenom down with a body slam. Austin's cheering for Undertaker on commentary as the match continues and Stone Cold pops when Taker pulls off a choke slam. There's a referee bump next and Kyoto gets wiped out before Kane tries a tombstone, but Taker counters and the dead man pulls off his tombstone. There's no referee to count the pin, so here comes the fired Mick Foley dressed in his mankind gear. Foley applies the mandible claw on Undertaker and Vince seems pretty happy even though McMahon fired Mick earlier on. Taker fights out, Foley falls to the floor. Unfortunately, the Undertaker gets distracted when Foley again jumps on the apron, and this leads to Kane taking advantage and winning the match with a tombstone pile driver. An unexpected victory here when you consider Taker's promo earlier on and Taker's track record against his little brother, but Kane is now the number one contender and again Vince seems pretty happy. Kane steps outside the ring to face Stone Cold. 
He sets off his pyro before walking away, and when The Undertaker wakes up the dead man launches an attack on Foley. Vince says he's maybe having second thoughts about Mick. Jerry Lawler says Mick's only doing this to impress Mr McMahon, and Vince is absolutely fine with that. Raw goes off the air with Foley and Taker continuing to fight as JR confirms that Kane is next in line for a shot at Stone Cold. Bret Hart and the Booty Man come to the ring with Hogan and Giant and look at Bret staring at that world championship. Again, I'm convinced that Bret was aiming for the world belt all along and he was going to portray Hogan at some point, but plans changed. It actually seems pretty obvious at this point. Hogan rips off his NWO shirt and he throws it at Lex. Lex wipes his stinking pits with it while Nash uses it to wipe his ass. And it's Lex who gets the better of Hogan right away with a big old shove. Lex poses, Hollywood complains about hair pulling, and Hogan goes down again after getting grazed with Lex's left arm. How does Hogan get the upper hand? That's right, a poke to the eye. Hollywood hits Lex with a few throat thrusts, he rakes his eyes, Lex is able to fight back long enough to make a tag, and in comes big sexy Kevin Nash. Nash tells Hogan to stay in the ring and do not tag out. Hogan stays in, the crowd begin to cheer and clap as Nash raises his arms in the air, and it's Kevin who goes on offense when the two get to work. Hulk takes a corner clothesline, but he comes back with one of his own. He's getting outmatched here though, so the champ tags out and the giant comes in. The two big men lock up and the giant overpowers Nash. Nash manages to turn it around in the corner, but at the opposite side of the ring, Big Sexy goes down after a big boot to the face. Giant misses an elbow drop, Nash tags in Flexi Lexi, and the giant ends up flooring the total package with a big old clothesline. Hogan comes in and Lex gets held in the black and white corner. Nash isn't going to stand around and do nothing, so Big Kev comes in to help his buddy out and this is where the match ends. Hogan uses the world belt to hit Kevin and we have ourselves a disqualification in the Nitro main event. What a shocker. Sting then begins making his way down to the ring very, very slowly. He gets inside the ropes and he reveals a black and white NWO shirt. The reaction's pretty fascinating. There's a small pop at first, but then it gets drowned out with boos, showing us that fans were actually ready to boo Sting if he turned heel and joined the black and white. When Sting clotheslines Hogan after giving him a hug though, the audience get really loud. They pop again when the Stinger body slams the giant, and the crowd reaction in the arena when Sting rips off the NWO black and white shirt to reveal a Wolfpack shirt underneath is nothing short of amazing. Sting has joined the NWO Wolfpack. The thought of Sting wearing an NWO shirt just a few weeks ago seemed crazy, and yeah, it isn't the original black and white NWO, but it's still a pretty ballsy move to put Sting in an NWO shirt and put him in a faction that, at the time, still had to prove themselves in terms of durability. It's a moment in Nitro history right here, and we're gonna see a new, more vocal Sting on Monday Nitro from this point forward. Nitro wins reliving the war once again, and it comes down to match quality and key moments. Booker T vs Benoit is a match that I just can't get tired of. Jericho's antics in Washington was hilarious, and then you had the big sting reveal that the whole show was centered around. Raw did a good job of once again telling a contained story, this time it was all about The Undertaker, but there was just a lot more fun to be had on Nitro this week in terms of entertainment value. So Nitro now has 57 points, Raw has 64, and we're still on 15 ties. In the TV ratings, Raw defeated Nitro with a 4.4, Nitro got a 3.7. Join me next week and we'll see the debut of Tomato Face Sting. Jericho reads out a letter he received from Ted Turner in regards to the Cruiserweight Championship, and the Best of Seven series continues with match number six. On Raw, Steve Blackman and Farouk take on Double J and Mark Merrow. We get more King of the Ring qualifiers, including Owen Hart vs. Two Cold Scorpio, and Vince McMahon receives a humanitarian award for being such a good human being. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next week.